to our online talk series, Waterford in the 1920 Local Elections, Fighting for a Voice in a New Ireland. This is part of the Waterford Decade of Commemorations Events Programme, supported by Waterford City and County Council and the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht under the Decade of Centenary's 2012 to 2023 initiative. I'm delighted to introduce historian Emmett O'Connor of the Department of History at Ulster University. Emmett is an honorary president of the Irish Labour History Society and has published widely on labour history, including Reds and the Green, Ireland, Russia and the Communist Internationals, 1919-43, Big Jim Larkin, Hero Wrecker, and Dairy Labour in the Age of Agitation, 1889-1923. The title of Emmett's talk is Waterford Labour in the Red Flag Times, 1917-1922. Hello. To understand the labour militancy and radicalism of 1917-1923, it has to appreciate that these were extraordinary times in Europe and that Ireland was never as isolated as some historians would have you believe since the growth of sea power, of empire and of contact with the Americas in the late 18th century. Ireland was one of the, one of the most globalised countries in the world. Every major political movement in Ireland from the volunteers of 1778 up to Black Lives Matter has been a consequence of international factors. This is particularly evident in 1917 to 1923, when Europe was giddy with the idea of a bright new future, and there was to be a, a radical future. It was a widespread feeling that there could be no going back to the governance of the pre-1914 years, and governance by the elites who had blundered into the terrible catastrophe that was World War I. Also, it was expected that there would have to be a payback for labor for its support during the World War. And there was a payback in the form of Chapter 13 of the Treaty of Versailles, which set up the International Labor Organization. The job of the International Labor Organization was to improve working conditions internationally. And everybody, uh, Sorry, and the, the, a Tremor man, Ned Phelan, would play a key role in the ILO in Geneva. Here's a picture of uh, Ned Phelan on the right with the first director, uh, Albert Thomas. And uh, Phelan himself would be, eventually become director of the ILO in, in the 1940s. In Russia, the Bolsheviks were in power and Many expected that they might take the revolution to the West. And for Irish Republicans, their policies of opposition to the World War and to imperialism and support for national self-determination chimed with those of Sinn Féin. In America, President Wilson had announced his 14-point plan for peace and promised that peace would be based on democracy and self-determination. So th this cartoon gives you an idea of how you know, Sinn Féin saw uh, things developing uh, after the war, that Ireland would be admitted to, to the peace conference and would be granted self-determination. And that was to be the, the key strategy uh, of Sinn Féin. They weren't thinking, in December 1918 at any rate, they weren't thinking of an IRA campaign. In many European countries, 1919 to 1920 are known as the two red years. And in Ireland, farmers would remember them as the red flag times. The rise of the labour movement between 1917 and 1923 was due fundamentally to the World War. The first half of the war brought shortages and inflation and generated class tensions against the farmers, the shopkeepers and the employers who were believed to be profiteering. Until the later war years, there was no adequate system of rationing or price control. And even then the system was not very satisfactory. In Britain, there were hunger marches in some cities. The threat of a strike by munitions workers in Britain in 1916 led the government to keep the war effort going by liquidating national assets to release more money into the economy. So from 1917, wages rose faster than prices, but the money was only there for those who could get it, and to get it, he needed to join a trade union. So the first half of the war stored up grievances, and the second half provided a means of redress. Events were also influenced by revolution at home and abroad. The War of Independence paralyzed the police and it was impossible to ignore the European wide radicalism of these years. Industrial conflict took on an exceptionally combative character, partly due to the militancy of the protagonists 
the primitive state of conciliation and arbitration machinery in Ireland, which is much less advanced in Ireland than it was in Britain, and the general breakdown of law and order. For tactics, Labour chose to revive pre-war Larkinism, which is the form of militancy that it was most familiar with. So strikes involved an emphasis on sympathetic and generalised action. What was different about post-war Larkinism was that it spread well beyond the main towns. The Irish Trade Union Congress became a nationwide force for the first time. It also became more politically conscious and it changed its name in 1918 to the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress. One of the first sectors to be affected by the war was agriculture. Labour's bargaining position was strengthened by the introduction of compulsory tillage orders to ease the food supply crisis in January of 1917. The number of farm labourers was in steady decline, but they still made up almost 200,000 out of 900,000 waged workers in Ireland. Waterford was one of four counties in Ireland which had more than two labourers to every farmer. The tillage orders in turn created the first labour shortage in agriculture since the Napoleonic Wars, compelling the introduction of an agricultural wages board in September to set up to set minimum rates of pay in order to keep workers on the land. Wage movements on the land began in the spring of 1917. Initially, labourers revitalised various local land and labour associations and demanded land redistribution and more plots of land. But by 1918, local associations were being absorbed into the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union, and they were focusing on wages. In 1916, the ITGW had 5,000 members, and by 1920, it had 120,000, 60,000 of them in agriculture. The Union of Urban Workers also gathered pace in 1917. The ITGW's first branch in County Waterford was opened in Dungarvan, in February of 1918. A union census in June of 1917 showed that it had 582 members in the branch. 317 were in food production, 61 were in transport, 173 were in, in industry. Jack Butler and Thomas McCarthy were later made full-time officers in Dungarvan. Butler is an example of the way the rise of labour brought a new wave of leaders to the fore. He was born in Ballina in 1990 and raised in Dungarvan. He left school in 15 to become a labourer. He joined the ITGW and was elected to Dungarvan Board of Guardians in 1918 and he won election to the County Council in 1920. By 1920 the ITGW had 20 branches in the county. Branches were based on parishes and included all sorts of workers. For example, the Port Law branch in 1918 included 110 agricultural labourers, 22 general workers, six foresters, eight carters and porters, four tradesmen, a baker, a canal man, and the local postman. And that kind of integration was very unusual because up to 1914, uh, unions had usually been based on one particular trade. And certainly tradesmen didn't like the idea of associating with labourers. So the fact that they were coming together on a class basis was quite novel and quite radical. Because profits were booming, it was relatively easy for employers to accommodate wage increases. But there were strikes and new strike tactics, like the general local strike. The first of these took place in Yall in December of 1917. A stoppage by members of the National Union of Dock Labourers for an increased war bonus was met by the local employers' federation with a lockout of all unskilled men in the town's mills, shops, and factories. After a week, the craftsmen came out in sympathy. Again, this was unusual enough craftsmen striking in sympathy with laborers. Mass pickets were formed to prevent the movement of goods. Strikers toured employers' yards, removing horses and drays. Extra RIC and troops were uh, drafted in. And after two weeks, the dispute was settled to the workers' satisfaction. Just over 18 months later, another strike took place in Dungarvan. Over 250 employees in virtually all the town's larger businesses were involved. Almost immediately, sympathetic action paralyzed local commerce and trading passed under the control of the union, the ITGWU. 
Nothing could be bought or sold without a union permit. Nothing could enter the town without union permission. The strike committee set up its own rationing system for food and fuel supplies. This situation obtained for a month until the settlement was reached. Here's an example of a pass. This dates from the big farm strike in 1923, but it just gives you an idea of what a pass looked like. Simple document. But the whole point was that if he accepted the pass, he accepted the authority of the union. And it meant that the union was exerting uh, territorial control. The Dungarvan strike was the 11th local general strike to have taken place since 1917. And a comparison with Yall is instructive. In Yall, the initiative lay with the employers. The union tactics e evolved reactively in response to a lockout. Now, by contrast, Dungarvan saw the immediate application of a comprehensive strike strategy. Altogether, 14 small towns experienced local general strikes during the advance of the wages movement. And here, here we see a list of the towns. In Waterford City, the ITGW's number one branch was restarted in 1917. It had been formed initially in 1909, and then it collapsed uh, during the war. Restarted in 1917, it had 903 members by June of 1918. The second branch then in the city was open for 200 workers in the, the cartridge factory at, at uh, Bilbury, one of a number of munitions factories set up to sort of uh, mollify uh, John Redmond uh, in the later war years. Now, looking uh, at agriculture, by 1921, the ITGW had organized about 2,500 farm workers in Waterford and about 6,000 farm workers another 2,000 or so occasionally, uh, who worked occasionally on the land. In Waterford wages had risen from about 14 shillings a week in 1915 to a peak of 35 shillings a week in May of 1920. This, of course, was a time of very high inflation. So the increase in real wages was much smaller. The Agricultural Wages Board had reduced the maximum working week to 60 hours and then 54 hours. The farmers too started to organize, and by 1920, the Irish Farmers Union had 60,000 members. Waterford avoided major uh, conflict between farmers and laborers up to 1922, but there were a few sectional strikes and a famous incident called the Fenner Malay. The dispute was over attempts to enforce a closed shop in the Fenner district. And according to the Munster Express of the 29th of November, 1919, exciting scenes took place in the Fenner district on Monday at last, a pitch battle was fought on the roadside between the police and farm laborers, in which revolver shots, batons, bayonets were freely used. Five policemen were injured, and there were several casualties among the laborers. For some months past, there's been considerable friction between laborers and farmers in Fenner, which culminated on Saturday in a general lockout of workers. The farmers arranged to thrash their own corn without outside help, this incurred the wrath and resentment of the laborers, ending in Monday's wild scenes. The Fenner Malay was celebrated in an earthly ballad. It went, the month of November being late in the year when the laborers of Fenner did, did appear to uphold the union the best way they should and to put down the farmers the best way they could. The ITGW secretary, Nicholas Phelan, Patrick Dalton and Patrick Hanley were subsequently arrested and tried by special court in Waterford. The local section of the IFU was the Waterford Farmers Association, which had 31 branches in 1920, and was led by an enterprising and militant uh, leader, uh, Sir John Keane, fifth baronet of Bel Belmont near Capaquin. Here we see a picture of Keane and his family. And uh, on the right there, you, you can see a, a kind of caricature of the Irish Farmers Union. You've got a, far, a well to do farmer. And he's sort of postering over uh, the uh, Southern Unionist Association with Irish Farmers Union. By this stage, a lot of Southern Unionists accepted that some kind of home rule or self-government was inevitable. And they thought to sort of perform a new role for themselves and gain new acceptance in the new state by uh, joining the, um, the Irish Farmers Union. The IFU also took up the, the idea of a paramilitary force uh, proposed by Keane, he proposed that they should form this force to deal with Labour by refusing to negotiate with Union officials and strike breaking. 
and suggested it be called the Farmers' Freedom Force to combat what they call Bolshevism and Russian methods. In the event, the farmers decided to wait the return of strong government, as they call it, after the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The ITGW became by far the biggest and most important union in Ireland by this time. By 1920-21, it represented about half of all trade unionists, who in turn made up about 25% of employees. But all unions experienced growth, and trade unionism, which had largely been confined to craftsmen, extended to the unskilled, to clerical workers, and to women. Moving on to labour politics in the local elections in 1920. Labour, of course, had stood down from the 1918 general election. The critical issue was, was uh, abstention, which is not a problem during the World War, as the Redmondites, too, had walked out of Westminster when the conscription bill was uh, enacted. This is um, post or against conscription in Australia. It wasn't just a, la uh, a national issue. It was, you know, by the labor movement, it was seen as, as a labor issue. Uh, you know, this idea that you could force a worker to go to war, force anyone to go to war and, and be killed. It was denounced um, as Prussianism. You know, they said, this is the sort of thing we're supposed to be fighting against. But Labour had been expecting a wartime election with the, the Redmondites and Sinn Féin still uh, both abstaining. So all of a sudden the war came to an end in um, November. It, in September, it looked as if the war would drag on for another year. But by the end of September, it was clear it was going to be over within weeks and that the Redmondites would go back into Parliament after the next election. Which way did Labour go? Did it stay outside with the Sinn Féin and illegality, or did it go into Parliament with the Redmondites and maybe run the risk of uh, losing support? So I thought, well, look, you know, this is a, an awkward choice. We'll just uh, stand back. We're gaining ground all the time. We're getting stronger and stronger. James Connolly said that politics is only the echo of the battle, that real strength depends on industrial power. So, you know, We've nothing to lose if, if we wait another few years. So they decided to stay out. Of course, uh, it, we can see in retrospect that it was a failure of leadership. But in fairness, the, the signals from the base of the movement were not very clear. In September, the ITUC executive discussed feeling a candidate in Waterford. And in early October, the Trace Council convened a meeting to select a candidate. But the, the meeting decided to await instructions from the executive. And then the executive wouldn't act without pressure from the membership. So they got caught in that sort of circular uh, inaction. The Sinn Féin landslide left Labour feeling that it had missed the bus. And it took a more in interventionist role in the independence struggle. On May Day 1919, Labour called a general strike for self-determination and international working class solidarity. Waterford Trace Council organised a big parade with four bands. In Lismore, over 400 marched, led by the local ITGW president on horseback, followed by a banner inscribed Labour Triumphant, with an escort <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of mounted carters and a fight and drum band. Other parades were held in Kilmacthomas, Capaquin, and Dungarvan. In October 1919, Labour convened a national conference of trades councils and decided to contest the next local elections in January of 1920. The elections had been postponed since 1917, and the British government introduced proportional representation in an attempt to prevent more Sinn Féin landslides. There were six trace councils in 1914 and 38 by 1919. The conference decided to contest the elections, but left selections and programs to the local trace councils. Labour won 18% of the vote and 394 seats to 550 for Sinn Féin, 238 for the Redmondites and 335 for the Unionist Party. Can I pause there because I'm I, I need to get a <coughs> drink of water. Hello, Dean. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, fire away. Okay, I'll just get a, a drink of water. Hold on. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, sorry. Yeah, try and resume now, yeah? Yeah, you can resume away. You might just um, count about 10 seconds again before you start. So you can start sorry, what was that again? Just count about 10 seconds before you start. Okay. Um, so count from now and then okay. far away. The results in Waterford were more, were more modest. In the city, Labour took three out of 40 seats on the corporation and elected Tommy Dunn, Alderman Richard Keane and Luke Larkin. Dunn was Transport Union Secretary in Waterford. Keane was an old railway man who had been victimised in the 1911 rail strike and be then became a coal merchant. He was also a member of the ITGW. Luke Larkin was another uh, railway man in the National Union of Railway Men and the most enterprising activist on the Trades Council. The Munster Express thought Dunn closer to the Redmondites and Larkin and Kane closer to Sinn Féin. It also thought the slump in the Labour vote surprising and attributed the Sinn Féin success to party cohesion and its ability to work the new PR. On Dungarvan Urban District Council, Labour fielded nine candidates and won three out of 15 seats, electing uh, Michael Greeney from the Carpenters Union, Patrick Ducey and P. Moore, both transport join. In this more Labour won two out of nine seats. The Labour candidates were Edward O'Shea, president of the local branch of the Transport Union, and, and Timothy Duggan, another Transport Union man. Labour was seen as the victor in the election and is celebrated with a big torchlight parade, followed by what was described as an immense crowd. In Waterford City, uh, Sinn Féin won an overall majority and Dr. Vincent White was elected mayor on the 23rd of February. He saw his job as being to quote, to tear asunder the old order of things which had been set up generations before by the English regime of public administration. Famously, he pointed to the mace and told the municipal mace bearer, remove that bauble. He also replaced the mayor's traditional red cloak with a tricolor robe. And the Redmondites responded uh, in doggerel, in the town hall is a great Armadon who wants to be known as Vincent O'Bon. Within weeks of uh, the election, the town hall was raided and the cloak was seized by the, by the British Army. They also seized two revolvers from the, the councillors. White colluded also with the, uh, the Waterford Soviet. The Soviet was another of the many instances of Labour support for the independence struggle and it illustrated how the struggle was radicalizing labor. It emerged from the decision of the Irish Trade Union Congress to call an immediate general strike on, on Monday, the 12th of April, for the release of 66 Republicans on hunger strike in Mountjoy for political status. Once the strike began, it acquired a class and even a revolutionary character. Throughout Nationalist Ireland, it was enforced by workers' councils, many of which assumed uh, control of their areas in the style of. Soviets complete with red guards. White handed the city over to Luke Larkin and he allowed the Waterford Strike Committee to operate from the city hall. 
on Tuesday and Wednesday, the committee set about regulating commerce and demonstrated its, its authority through a, a permit system. So possibly they went too far and touring around the pub was a victim of sound ons. Shortly after five o'clock on Wednesday, word came through that Dublin Castle had backed down. The castle had become alarmed at the possibility of the National Revolution turning Bolshevist. And the British government agreed to release the prisoners awaiting trial or deportation and in need of hospital treatment. So labor was jubilant. The Bodford thousands flocked to the city hall where a red flag was held out from, from the building to loud cheers. And this revolutionary theater uh, made a bigger impact, I think, in Britain than in Ireland. The Manchester Guardian, for example, observed on the 20th of April, the direction of affairs passed during the strike to these workers' councils, which were formed not on a local, but on a class basis. There is no exaggeration to trace the flavor of proletarian dictatorship about some aspects of the strike. On the 27th of April, the Guardian featured an article ahead of the Soviet government in Waterford, which reported that a deputation of Southern loyalists to number 10 Downing Street had given uh, Prime Minister Boner, Boner Law a full account of events in the city, which had been taken over by a Soviet commissioner and three associates. On the 24th and 28th of April, the British Labour paper, the Daily Herald, carried articles on Waterford's Red Guards and they reported a red flag flowed over the town hall and a sort of red guard was established under the transport union leaders. In short, the city was ruled by a Soviet during the time of the strike. The Irish media played down the red flaggery partly because it didn't wish to assist the British efforts to depict the national revolution as Bolshevist. But Mayor White said he was not perturbed at some reports of him coming under Soviet government. On the contrary, he congratulated Quote, the Soviet government of Waterford in a very effective, masterly and successful demonstration. And he hoped the time will not be long in coming when the Soviet government of Waterford will have an opportunity of again demonstrating the powers it undoubtedly possesses. Now, you could argue that the Soviet was, was simply political theatre, but arguably, too, it was more sophisticated for that. And it reflected a spirit that the, the labour leaders failed to exploit. At the time, it seemed to, there seemed to be no urgency because labor was getting stronger and stronger. And the economy, as Bertie Hearn would say, was getting boomier and boomier. Elections for the county councils and rural district councils were held in June. They won eight seats on the county council and 12 of the 21 seats in Kilmacthomas Rural District Council. So what happened to all of this militancy and radicalism? Well, the short answer is the slump. The boom and the exp massive expansion of the world's productive capacity created a crisis of overproduction in 1920. Food prices started to fall in August of 1920. And it was a bit like 2008, the year of the banking crash. You know, everything was going grand in the spring, and then it all started to go pear shaped in the autumn. Industry was affected in 1921. And by 1922, over 25% of insured workers were unemployed. Employers demanded a return to pre-war wage levels. And in Britain, there was a sudden adjustment following Black Friday, the 15th of April, 1921. And that was the day the British National Transport Workers Federation and the National Union of Railwaymen refused to support the miners. The miners were um, threatened with a pay cut. They'd gone on strike. They had this agreement with the other two big unions to that they should all support each other in the event of a strike. But the solidarity collapsed, and with it, um, union solidarity generally collapsed in, in Britain. And you had a whole series of pay cuts introduced over the next uh, 12 months. Now, employers expected the same thing would happen in Ireland uh, with the railwaymen providing the initial sacrificial victims in August of 1921. But the unsettled conditions generated by the truce, the split in the IRA, and the civil war delayed uh, employer action. Labour did well in holding its own up to 1923. Farm labourers defeated a wage uh, cut in May of 1922. This is um, to do with the uh, campaign against conscription. You had uh, a National Women's Day, Lawn Amon, on the, the 9th of June, and there was a big parade 
of um, women anti work anti conscription campaigners uh, in, in Waterford. These are the two uh, leaders of the labour movement at the time, Tom Johnson there on the left and uh, William O'Brien, who was also head of the Transport Union uh, on the right. Uh, these are the, uh, trans the um, Transport Union delegates to the Irish Trade Union Congress, which is held in Waterford in 1918. And this would have been taken, uh, I think, round about where the Tower Hotel is now. And you can see Tommy Dunn there, um, on on the far right, he's in the, he's in the third row on the far right, and for many decades, he was uh, secretary of the Transport Union in Waterford right up to he died I think about 1966. This is Vincent White, mayor of Waterford, in his tricolour robe, which was seized by the British Army in uh, 1920. Uh, Doctor White, he was a dispensary doctor, died in 1958. Uh, he took the pro-treaty side in the Civil War and later joined uh, Common Oil and Fine Gael. So Liver was doing well up to 1923 and um, things started to go badly wrong in that year. The strike of 1,500 farm labourers began in May and turned into a virtual civil war. Strikers regularly burned farmers' property and the farmers then uh, were, draft, were protected by 600 men of the Special Infantry Corps. It was a, a unit of the army which was raised specifically as armed police to deal with farm strikes. And the Union pickets were often referred to as the Red Guards. And in October, the uh, Farmers Union created these, this vigilante force, which called themselves the White Guards. So you had this like, miniature version of the, the, the Russian uh, Civil War going on in, in County Waterford. The Waterford Farmers Association uh, also composed a farmer's song. Uh, one verse went, Come every man stand in the van, let none be slack or space. For if the Bolshies win this fight, they'll grind our future race. But ere before, let one and all be loyal to his band. The red flag will be trampled on by true men of our land. So here you can see uh, the agreement that the farmers refused to sign in 1923. And you can see these agreements negotiated between the union and the farmers, they were quite elaborate and they um, provided for all sorts of uh, different categories of, of worker. So the, in 1923, the union was trying to hold on to the, to the top rate of wages. They were willing to compromise, and I think reduce wages to uh, 33 shillings a week at the top rate. The farmers wanted it down to 32 shillings a week and they, the laborers wouldn't accept that. So here, here's a farmer's propaganda document. Uh, it's a bit unclear, but you can see that the general idea, thou shalt not steal Bolshevist document, doctrines pre practiced, preached in Waterford. And it was an attempt to sort of say that the, you know, the, the, the laborers are all communists and they're trying to follow godless communism and so on. So this sort of bracketing of labor with uh, Russia was taking place. The overthrow of Tsarism and the Bolsheviks were very popular, 1918, 1919, but things did start to change about 1920, 21, 22. And uh, here we see special infantry. Uh, Maloney's boat, the Lady Bell, was brought into Dungarvan with supplies for the farmers in June of 1923. And here you can see it being unloaded. You can see the troops in Free State Army uniforms uh, helping to uh, guard the unloading of uh, the boat. And here you see again another picture and more, more troops there. This is another boat, the SS Carrigan. And the Carrigan again, 12th of July 1923, again with soldiers. And here again, this is a um, picture of farmers um, saving the hay with uh, obviously uh, Free State uh, Special Infantry Guards. So in all sorts of ways, 1923 was really a disaster for Labour. The general elections in August, the Labour vote um, fell 
to uh, about 12% of the poll, from, from 18% to about 12%. Nicholas Phelan had been expelled from the Labour Party for his failure to attend both sessions. And his place on the ticket was um, taken by the transport union organiser, Jimmy Baird. Baird had been a boiler maker in Harland and Wolf in Belfast, and he was victimised. He was one of a number of Protestant socialists who were victimised by the uh, loyalists in the 1920 programmes. And he ended up becoming a transport union organiser in Waterford, very nearly getting elected to, to the Dáil in 1923. But um, there was a big shakeout with the, you know, huge decline in, in membership of the union. There was a big shakeout of activists. And in the case of Beard, he and his wife and six children uh, emigrated to Australia and he died in Brisbane in 1948. And the Transport Union had 120,000 members in 1920. By 1929, that was down to 15,000. And over that period, uh, ITUC membership had fallen from 200,000 to 90,000. So in conclusion, many of the chronic problems that beset the labour movement throughout the 20th century can be traced back to these years. It would be unfair to accuse the leadership of betraying the rank and file. It was impossible to hold the harvest. That was the slogan they used, hold the harvest of wage grains. But it was very, very difficult to do that in the context of a slum. Economic reality was against them. And the leadership was naive to have promised so much. And then, of course, it delivered so little. And that led to a lot of disillusionment with labor. It could be faulted too for not engaging with the national revolution and seeing it as an opportunity rather than a problem, and for failing to tackle the thorny question of the relationship between the political and the industrial side of the movement. The abiding weakness of the, the working class has been its lack of solidarity at the ballot box. Again and again, workers have refused to, to accept compromise from the Labour Party, but they end up taking it from Fianna Fáil, or they did in the past anyway. But Labour's silliest mistake was not to see that the good times would one day come to a halt, and that a boom is always followed by a slump. And we wouldn't be so stupid to make that mistake today, would we? Thank you. Um.